Yeah. So the secret is I retired when I was 40 for 10 years. And the idea was I have the energy now to travel around the world and to do all this stuff. And a lot of people, when they retire, they're too old to do all that stuff. So I thought, you know, after I get that out of my system, I'll go back to work when I've got a little wisdom and I can be like more of a mentor. And, um, and so I'm never going to retire. I mean, I'm having so much fun. You've and already it, done your retirement. I, I did that. Got out of the way. Did all the fun. How interesting. Stuff. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how you made that work financially. That's your business. Well, like, yeah, I, mean, I they still, say that like 40 to 55 are your top earning years. Well, you know, um, there was a company I developed a, a ultrasound imaging system for diagnosing prostate cancer told the, called the Technar ProScan. And the company was sold and we still all like each other, which is great. Years later, people still use this. I talked to a urologist the other day and he said, oh yeah, I've got one of those. So um, yeah, I got to retire and buy an airplane and a house at the beach and go wow. meet the Dalai Lama. It's rich. I didn't know that. No, I was. And then you squandered it, a life of dissipation. Yeah, I sent my kids to college and... <laughs> wow, you invented it. Yeah, yeah. So I got bored and after 10 years, I, I decided it was time to do some more stuff. So um, I did a lot of volunteering that was very fulfilling. And a friend of mine worked at Stanford Research Institute, SRI, mm -hmm. and he was lonely. So he convinced them to hire me. So he would have someone there he liked to, to work with. And they put me on the Da Vinci Surgical Robot Project. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that was really fun. So then I started a bunch of, oh, if you really want to lose money and you, you've experienced this, I started a bunch of companies because <laughs> I was bored. Mm -hmm. And that's a really, you know, the old joke about if you want to make a small fortune, start with a large fortune. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I learned some, I learned a lot of stuff. Maybe so. some of which you will share with us in the next hour. Yeah. I, I mm -hmm. You were so interesting. Who would, who would have thought? I didn't know. I know. I, I come across as just kind of mousy and... Those are your words. Yeah. When I first met you, I, you were working at Odo Nexus with Caitlin Cameron, mm -hmm. working on um, ear infections and using sonar to be able to see behind that wall. Yeah. Um, right. It was, you know, back in the day when my wife would even consider letting me invest any money at all. Um, I was like, this is going to be the next big thing. And I didn't give her any money because I gave it all to Tom Clement with his next big thing. And we all know how that works. Yeah. And as an aside, we can take this offline. I just talked to a company in Europe that's doing something very similar. To Caitlin's project? No, no, no. To the hydrocephalus. Tom's project? Yeah, to the hydrocephalus project. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, well, that's good. I mean, it's a product that needs to come to market. It's just a damn shame the way his didn't. Is the technology for sale? I imagine. Well, actually, I don't really know because everything went in receivership. So who knows who owns what? Yeah. Well, uh, I've got a bunch of AutoNexus stock and I could make you a really good deal if, if, you, if you want. All right. Well, uh, I know you prepared some slides and I glanced at them ahead of time. I think there's just a story you can tell, but if you like to use visual aids, then go ahead and use. I, I, I like to, because I think they're, I think they're kind of amusing actually. Okay. So I'm going to do the share screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So can you see that? I can. Good, good. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I've worked, did a lot work for a lot of different companies. You know, my backgrounds in public health and, and nursing. And um, when I worked at Procter and Gamble, my boss asked me to train a staff of nurses about business because they were they were doing a lot of training. So I've been training people in sales for a long time in business, and I decided to write a book, put some of the some of the thoughts down in a book. So I wrote this book, and this talk is kind of based on that. Do you, and, you have a physical copy of the book? Uh, it's on Amazon. I know. But do you, do you have one that you can show the nice people at home? Wait, wait to the end. I know. I don't want to wait to the end. Come on. Just do you have one on your desk? Hold no, I, I don't because it's only available as a Kindle. I didn't make it. Oh, okay. Uh, it's, it's not uh, Adam's. 
in molecules, it's just electrons. Fair enough. Okay. So the premise of the book is everyone is is in sales, whether they know it or not. And this is not in your company. It's you know, when you're talking to your spouse, to your friends, to your colleagues, to customers and clients, they're getting an impression about you and you can't avoid it no matter how hard you try. So you might as well get good at it. So the goal of this talk and the book it's based on is to give you a glimpse into how sales works with the intention that this knowledge will make you more effective. And I'm not trying to sell, turn you into a salesperson, heaven forbid, <laughs> that would be terrible. But I propose that understanding how sales work should be part of your skill set and survival kit. And as a side benefit, it will make your experiences interacting with salespeople less stressful, maybe more enjoyable. So that's where we're going. So I wrote this book and I was trying to think of a title. And Joe, you came up with some titles for me. And, you know, I tried them on and like how to win, a cus how to win with customers, an eight step survival guide or the secret life of this or how it really works. And an engineer friend of mine came up with, I think, a great title, which I decided not to use, but engineers will understand this. It's what every engineer thinks is BS, but your continued employment after product release actually depends on its success. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty funny. So this uh, talk is really a sneak peek into what goes on outside the walls of your office. And the premise is you know, regardless of what your specialty is, you know, you don't know everything. If you're an electrical engineer, you may not know much about mechanical engineering. And it's good to understand what the other folks are doing. So you can see how your uh, piece fits into the big puzzle. And that includes knowing a little about the mysteries, la mystère of sales and marketing. Will, will there be a, will there be a, a flagrant use of French throughout the presentation? No, that's it. <laughs> Merde. Anyway, um, there's, there are a lot of harmful stereotypes out there. Okay, Joe, you recognize this movie? I, it's all the show, yeah. Silicon okay. Valley. I Silicon enjoyed Valley. it. So I was going to use their picture of, you know, the nerds from the movie Nerds, but I decided to use this one instead. So there's an unfortunate but too often true belief by many that it's a mistake to allow an engineer near a customer the fear is that they'll say something or do something that will kill a sale or God forbid, put off a potential investor. And uh, we've all had that experience. Engineers just tend to blur out stuff that may not be useful at the time. There's an equally harmful, painful stereotype that engineers are not known for having especially high opinions of salespeople, you know, and often it's like, you promised them what? <laughs> uh, anyway, so, um, this is an unfortunate state of affairs because engineers and technical people have much to contribute to customer facing situations and can actually help bring in business and keep uh, customers happy, which is what keeps the lights on. So my goal is to get everybody to play nicely together by kind of having some insights and understandings. So there's a recurring nightmare. Um, and I've had this experience. I've asked my colleagues at Andrews Cooper, where I'm a business development guy, um, to make introductions you know, to, can you ask for a referral or, you know, we've got a happy client. Can you, can you get some names? And they, they're very reluctant. It's like, I think that would be sleazy or I don't want to do that. And, um, you know, I think there's this fear that if you're in sales, you're going to wake up one day with wearing a lot of cheap cologne and a gold necklace and a cigar. And, and it just is not a very appealing image. This is my best slide, by the way, that's, it's, it's downhill from now on. Oh, Okay. So, although that's not bad. So people, you know, the folks I talk to who aren't in sales, they think it's a necessary evil. It's got to be done. I mean, somebody's got to do it, but it shouldn't be me. It should be somebody else. And there's an interesting situation when a, a technical person or an engineer pivots and goes to marketing or project management. They're jokingly accused of going to the dark side. Um, so a more productive way to look at this is that you now have an advocate on the business side of the enterprise who understands and will stick up for you. And, and that's good. It's good that we understand each other. When I worked, uh, the first, one of the first uh, companies I worked at in Silicon Valley was uh, Diasonics, an ultrasound imaging and MRI company. Um, I was the only marketing person they led into the, um, the engineering lab because I wanted to learn and I, they knew that I appreciated what they were doing. And when I first came in, they joked I didn't know which end of a soldering iron to pick up. And by the end, I kind of figured that out, trial and error. 
And they appreciated kind of learning a little about what I did. And I used to drag the engine, not drag, but I would bring in, invite the engineers uh, to go with me to Stanford Hospital to see their products in use to, so they could understand how it was working. And I, I thought that was a win for all of us. So one of my big complaints and things that bug me are that everybody has their secret language. You know, you know everybody know what a TLA is? Joe? TLA, no. Three letter acronym. TLAs bug me. You know, pilots and aviators have TLAs, engineers do like TRLs, AFEs, DSPs. Engineers will know what a lot of these mean. And salespeople have their own acronyms. And my request is that when you're talking to someone outside of your specialty, that you don't use TLAs, you, you spell it out and tell them what it means because that will make communication better. So this- As this a writer, and you are also a writer, I yeah. think the rule is that you, as long as you write, for example, business to customer and then parenthetically B to C, you can use the acronym going forward. Exactly. First. But I'm talking about conversationally as well. Yeah. So, um, do you, okay, Joe, this is another one for you. I love this. ABC, always be closing. Where, what movie and what actor made this famous? Give me a hard question. Go ahead. Glenn, Gary, Glenn Ross, and it's uh, Alec Baldwin. Yeah. And it is also a video that was featured in a 10X as one of the clips between speakers. Yeah, Jack Lemmon was that movie. Great movie. Everybody should watch that movie. Fantastic. I just saw Glenn Gary on Broadway first before they <coughs> Really? Yeah. Lucky you, man. I, I just love that movie. And I used to use clips of that during my sales training. It was pretty funny. So, yeah, we all have our own acronyms. This is all in the book, so I won't linger on this. So what is sales? And um, a wide definition I use is an exchange of materials or services. You're solving a problem for money. So it's about, it's about value creation, and it's whatever – a fair value is, is what both sides agree on. Mm -hmm. So what is not, it's not manipulation, lying, breaking promises. That's not sales. That's a con. And we don't want to do that. Could do a little of both. <laughs> okay. So creating value, the organization, the mission of our organization or our service or what we do, our, oh, I'm sorry, our raison d'etre, that's the last French, is to effectively and efficiently solve problems and fulfill your customers' needs. What could be better than that? So attributes of successful customer engagement, another word for selling, and this applies not only to salespeople and business people, but to engineers and technical people and clinical people. You gotta love people. If you don't like people, you probably shouldn't spend a lot of time interacting with them because it's gonna come across. If you love people, you're gonna be interested in them and you're gonna wanna help and and that comes across. Uh, you need to know and understand. You your know what? I'm going to stop you only because of the incongruency of this slide versus, I think, your overall message, which began, even if you're not in sales, you're in sales, mm -hmm. which is to say that every human being is in sales. Yeah. And even I'm selling the value proposition that is me as a person, as a husband, as a father, as a churchgoer, whatever. Um, so... I don't think those who don't love people get a pass. They're still salespeople. Yeah. So you know, it's effective. Yeah, exactly. So that's something to work on, isn't it? <laughs> I think so. I made a nice living doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So every day, that's a challenge. Okay. You need to know and love your product or service. You know, if, if you don't understand it, you know, how can you communicate the benefits? And you've got to effectively communicate those attributes. And the best way to communicate those attributes is a story. Um, you know, Joe, as in, using you as an example uh, off the top of my head, you know, you could say, well, you know, uh, joining the Slack medical device group is great because we've got so many men, you know, so many members and we got so much percentage of this or that. And it's like, well, that's interesting. But if you told the story, like three of our members actually closed some really big sales through this that's much more powerful. Mm -hmm. And then here's the part that a lot of people, including salespeople, just miss all the time. You got to say these four magic words at the end of your pitch. Do you want it? And then you got to shut up and stop talking and let them say yes, no, I'll think about it. Literally it literally mean, do you want it? Do you want it? 
or, do or you want something like that. You know. Okay, it is something like that. I just wondered if you were being quite literal there. Okay. Yeah, it's all allegorical. So I used to, one, one of my fun jobs I had, Joe, you don't know about this, but I was director of a nonprofit foundation in Seattle called Mission Wise. Do you remember those guys? They were spinoff of Comprehensive Health Education Foundation, Chef, which was no. a from UW. Some UW professors uh, started an education, they were health educators, and they started a program for smoking and to not, to, you know, don't smoke for high school students. So they did this little thing. And just about the time they did that, the federal government passed a law with a huge budget saying, thou shalt teach this in schools. So their little uh, nonprofit went from, you know, like 100,000 in sales to 50 million in sales, like within a few years. We had two huge buildings in um, Des Moines, just south of the airport. And, um, and so we were selling all these educational um, materials. And then um, their funding ran out and their sales went from this back down to that. So they had warehouses full of materials and all this stuff and like, what do we do now? So they created a bunch of divisions and one of the divisions was um, mission wise and they hired me to, to direct that. And the purpose of that was to um, train nonprofits how to be sustainable because what happened in the nonprofit world is you get a grant say from Robert Wood Johnson or some other foundation. And it's usually like a three year declining grant. Every year you get a little less money and at the end of the time, um, you run out of money. And what the foundations were finding out is, and then the, what the people who made the grants found out is the nonprofits were going out of business. So they hired us because the nonprofits couldn't afford us to go in and teach them about marketing and sales and business plans and PR and all that stuff. So I got a chance to do a lot of training, how to write a business plan and all this stuff. And one of the first things I came up against was the nonprofits were, oh, money is evil and it's a terrible thing. And I'd say, okay, so if you don't have any money, how are you going to deliver hot meals to all these seniors? You know, or how are you going to provide mental health services in your community? Like money isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing if you use it in, in a good way. So if you don't, no margin, no mission. If you, if you don't have uh, the resources, you don't get to do your mission. So you got to rethink that because it's, it's just not very uh, useful. I don't understand what you meant by no margin, no mission. Oh, you're just saying you have to make money while you're doing it. Yeah. Okay. The key and I had, pearls, and I, I didn't really get it, but okay. Yeah. And I don't know if this is common outside, but in medicine at Grand Rounds or teaching, they always have these things. Physicians have what they call pearls of wisdom. You know, like if you take out a gallbladder, it's really useful to do this and that. So I made all these slides for, you know, my training called Pearls of Wisdom. Like I have these little pithy okay. sayings. I love pithy sayings. They're just my whole thing. So what, one of the things, um, if you're professionally uh, about sales, is it takes a lot of resilience. Um, so I'm just giving you some insights on what goes on with sales. On average, it takes at least four contacts, usually more to make a sale. And it can be a combination of phone calls, text, and these days in-person visits are kind of out, which makes it really tough. Most sales reps quit after two contacts. So persistence, resilience, all that stuff is really important in sales. And when I worked at Diasonics, I remember sitting around the conference table with the head of marketing and manufacturing and sales and all, all the groups were there to finance. And the, um, Engineers were complaining and they said, how come you sales guys get paid, get more, make four times more money than us engineers? We all, I got my PhD at Stanford. You know, I work my butt off creating these brilliant products that make a difference in the world. And you guys are out there playing golf with the customers and you work two days a week and, you know, like the gold chains and all that stuff. And, you know, it just doesn't seem fair. And the VP of sales said something I will never forget. He said, take a territory. So I did. Um, I had started a new division, the surgical imaging division. Um, and um, so I was running that and I, I hired a national sales force, but I took the West Coast as a territory because I thought as the product manager, I was going to go get my hands dirty and see how it was like. And what I found was shocking because as a marketing person, when a salesperson took me in to see a customer, 
we made the sale hundred percent of the time. It always works. So I thought sales is easy, man. There is nothing to it. But I realized there was kind of a halo effect that, you know, someone from the central office is there and everybody behaved really well. But when I was wearing my salesperson hat without that backup, I'd knock on the door. I get the door slammed in my face. I'd have physicians ducking out the back door to avoid having to talk to me. It was a lot of rejection. It was really hard. And I have a, a lot of respect for salespeople now. It's, it's not easy. You're saying that salesperson plus Mark, the engineer, equals win. Mark, just as sales, equals lose. How about well, Mark, just as engineer, who makes the call? Is that a win? I guess what I'm saying is there's a, it, it's, well, the real takeaway is sales is more difficult than it looks. I know. And that having support from, you know, headquarters is really helpful. Yeah. You know, and that it's easy to get fooled into thinking it's really easy uh, when you've got all that support. But when you're out alone, it's, it's yeah. a lot harder. Well, I, I am asking a different question. Yeah. If multidisciplinary people like you, who completely understand the product, were to be in the front lines, does, hey, I'm the product expert calling you, buy you more than... It's so weird the way that the light of the ca uh, computer is reflecting off your glasses right now. You know, it was just like it was completely covering your irises and it looked like you were like some kind of robot. Um, I, I just wonder if, if because as a marketer, uh, and that's all I do really, um, I recognize that it's all about education now. I mean, yes, I tell a story, but I tell a story that's based in an education about something. And who better to educate than the product expert, as long as the product expert is able to explain it in a way that my mother-in-law can understand. That is like so insightful, Joe. Um, yes, um, by, by being an expert, having expert, uh, domain expertise, I think that's a, that's a huge step up. And, um, you know, there's such a thing as a sales engineer, you know, and technical companies like chip manufacturers like Intel and stuff have these sales engineers. And then there's something called an AFE, which is an application field engineer, engineer yeah. and stuff. And um, at one of your um, networking uh, parties, Joe, years ago in a bar somewhere in Seattle, I met this really interesting woman whose name I can't remember. And she was doing outbound telemarketing. Okay. So there's, there's a situation where someone doesn't have a lot of technical knowledge, but they call up, they get an appointment, and then they hand them off to an expert. Right. And she said something that just blew my mind, and she's t trademarked it or something, but it's, uh, life is short, dial hard. Huh. I thought that was, and that's, you know, there are a lot of these phone banks where you just call and call and get appointments, and you don't have to know very much. You just say, let me, you know, let me connect you with someone who's got some expertise. Right. So. Uh, Joanne Evans just made the comment that while an engineer like, like you went into a sales role, it, you'd be hard pressed to find a sales guy who would go into an engineering role based on what is required. Well, two things. I'm not an engineer. Uh, I have a degree in nursing and a degree in public health. But I learned a lot about engineering by carpooling to Silicon Valley with, uh, with one of my colleagues who was an engineer, and he taught me a lot. And like I said, they allowed me into the lab. And I learned enough to know how to design an ultrasound machine. So that's how the Technar Pro Scan came about. So um, I do know which end of the soldering iron to pick up, barely. <laughs> oh, but I like engineers. There are a lot, I got a lot of – everyone in my family are either teachers uh, in medicine – or engineering. So I think some of it just kind of rubs off. Hey, Rob. Hey, how's it going? Good. What's up? Yeah, so I, I just uh, posted in the Q&A that when I was working at Bausch & Lomb, I designed uh, a Torah contact lens to go on your eye. And we had a series of what I call the dog and pony shows. Yeah. And initially, it was like uh, 20 of the best KOLs. And we found that they use the Wait, tell, tell, tell them what a KOL is. Oh, key opinion later. Thank Sorry you. about the acronym. <laughs> should, should have caught myself. Um, and they, they ended up using the product a lot, but they were our KOLs. Um, but then we did a test study where we went to about 100 other doctors that were kind of our lukewarm uh, people. 
And we found a huge uptick in how much they use the product once they talked to the actual engineers that did the design work. So we got completely in the weeds. The whole purpose was basically to say, here's all the cool technology. We're really smart. You should give it a try. And then you'll be a hero. And that actually worked so well that we ended up presenting to around 600 of our mid-tier uh, doctors. That's absolutely true. You know, when, when I was selling, one of the first, com first questions they asked was, who else is using this? You know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's a really good insight. I think that's absolutely true. When I um, was uh, VP of marketing for hire for Imacor, uh, they sell transesophageal echo probes. I think every one of the real sales calls required a field service engineer because the sales guys simply couldn't explain the technology to a degree to the people who would use it you know, and certainly for an install, it, it was, there was no question. So um, the number of FSEs they had, field service engineers, um, was the constraint for how productive sales could be. And there were not enough. So it was always like, how can I get this person on my calendar type of thing? I didn't know that was Imacor. I didn't know you were helping those guys out. I know them really well. Uh, we can exchange some funny stories about their CEO one day. I was doing transesophageal echo for about a year with um, another company. Which one? Uh, Esaota Biosound. So the Imacor was more of an ICU. Yeah. Thing. It, but I, I use it mostly during, during open heart surgery. Oh, yeah. Well, that one is, yeah. this one, the, the concept of the Imacor is that it was micro thin and that it could stay in dwelling for 72 hours. Yeah, yeah. I'm it super not happy. replace echo probes that happen when you're under anesthesia on the table. Those yeah, are quarter yeah. million dollar products. This was a thousand dollars a probe. Yeah, anyway, we, we could talk about that later. Anyway, interesting. So here's, you know, when, when the engineers I would talk to would be reluctant to uh, make introductions or any of that good stuff, my, my plea is be generous. And uh, the subtext, and I didn't want to be negative, like, don't be stingy. Like, if you've seen a great movie or went to a great restaurant, why wouldn't you want to share, right? So I'd say be generous. If you believe you're very good at what you do and you can help clients achieve their goals, it would be stingy not to respectfully request introductions or referrals. And you can do it in a very respectful way. And they said, ah, I don't I feel sleazy. It's like, you, you got to get over that. And that's a real uh, expensive attitude to have. And here's something, this one slide, if you embrace this, it will change your life. It will change your life. Going beyond your comfort zone. <clears throat> My friend Sandale gave me this. He said, ask for 100% of what you want, 100% of the time. Be willing to hear no and negotiate a win-win. Tell us what that means to you. I mean, I understand, say what I want, be willing to hear no. I understand the concept of negotiate a win-win, but you're starting at a deficit there. I mean, you know, if you, if you <clears throat> basically, if you ask for everything as opposed to incremental sales, I'm not, you know, I get, you feel very strongly about this and I'm sure you could talk to me about why it makes sense. It just it doesn't seem so black and white to me. Yeah, and it's not black and white. And I'm going to demonstrate this um, on my last slide because I'm going to ask for 100% of what I want from this group. Um, but here's what I've noticed about myself is, you know, I don't ask for what I want all of the time or 100% of what I want. And we're all very tiptoeing around and we don't want to, offend people or put people off or whatever. And it's just very limiting. You know, it's, we, we take the safe way out, you know, um, and it's just a suggestion. Just try it on and see, see if it works. And again, it's not black and white and there are times when it's not appropriate, but just think about what would life look like if you actually asked for what you really wanted instead of tiptoeing around it. It's a concept. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's, it's a, it's a huge shift in how most people operate. That's all. 
So um, there are a lot of ways to look at the world. And, you know, what's the old joke? There are two types of people, the type of people who divide, divide the world into two types, and then there's the others, something like that. Anyway, um, one, one way um, to look at uh, this world is they're farmers and they're hunters. And the farmers are the more conservative, you know, um, things are kind of, you can plan and you can predict and you don't like to do things that are kind of like wild. And I call them the quants or quantitative folks. And then there are the hunters, the quals, the qualitative folks. They may starve to death because uh, the, the big game may not wander by, but boy, when they, when they score a big win, they feast and they have a really great time. So there are different types of folks and there's obviously a continuum, but it's, it's kind of important to understand you know, who you're dealing with. And um, one of my one of other past careers, I was the medical director of La Clinica de la Raza, a community health clinic in uh, Oakland, California. And I was, um, I was definitely the hunter. I was out going, let's do stuff, let's innovate, let's buy a new computer, let's do this. And my boss was a farmer. It's like, well, how much does it cost? And what if it doesn't work? And, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we were just at loggerheads all the time. And we really didn't like each other much. And then um, I, bought, I hired a consultant. He called himself a marriage counselor for corporations in trouble. His name is George Bransky. And he's up in Laconer, Washington now. He was in Oakland at the time. And he got us to sit down and explained our different personalities about, you know, using this model. He got us to actually laugh at each other because he said, Mark, do you realize that Amelia thinks you're completely out to lunch and out of control and are dangerous? <laughs> and I said, what? And, and then he said, Amelia, do you realize Mark thinks you're totally out to lunch and that you're just trying to, you know, destroy the clinic by not making important decisions? And she said, me? And, you know, we kind of saw how each of our roles, you know, had important uh, contribution to making the clinic successful. So that was, uh, that's one way to look at it. So um, I had fun with this slide. Things you probably didn't learn in your physics class. One of the things is we all come in with our built-in factory settings, and this is um, uh, Bridget Fetessy came up with, she's a, a blogger, she came up with this. We come in with the way we see the world and we sort of assume that we think everybody else sees the world the same way we do and, and they don't. And, and that can be very upsetting because it looks like other people are crazy or just trying to make us crazy or gaslighting us or being manipulative or whatever. And it's just not the case. And everyone experiences in the world through their own filters, like wearing different colored lenses in your sunglasses. And it can be a challenge to understand whether people are coming from. But if, if you really get that, you know, this standing where they are, that's the way things look to them. And we're standing where you are, that's the way things look to you. And that once you kind of understand that, that gives you, you can kind of lighten up a little bit. So that's an important insight. Here is one of my favorite slides. You all know who that is, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a picture of Sigmund Freud was hanging above the mantelpiece in the house where I grew up because my dad was a psychiatrist, and I thought it was a, like an uncle or something. I didn't know who it was. Um, but, you know, technical problems are easy. You know, if you have enough time and money and resources, you can solve almost anything. We put a man on the moon. Elon Musk demonstrates this all the time. People problems are hard. People get cranky, moody, upset. They've got biases. You know, it's tough. So... An important thing to understand is that buying and selling are fundamentally irrational activities informed by rational thought. For example, I'm going to use you again. When you got that Mini Cooper, you got a Mini Cooper, right? How much of that decision was, God, that's really cool. I want that. And how much was you looked at the numbers and specs and said, you know, I can, I can justify this. Bad example. Beth is in charge of everything here. Okay. So I had very little say. Okay. And uh, she was, <laughs> Shopping for a car we could lease for a year for that yeah. transition period. So yeah. it was functional and something that she could. Okay. So a uh, bad example, but. Um, but yes, we get the point. Yeah, you get the point. I'm so sure. there's, there's a lot of neuroscience research now going on talking about right brain, left brain. Do you all know Kahane? He, he wrote a book, uh, Slow Thinking, Fast Thinking, brilliant book about. Mike's for Duty is all about uh, neuro marketing. I know Mike. Some great presentations, and they're available on 
uh, my channel if anyone wants that. No, Mike is great. He's great. I especially love his uh, his fashionable choice of shirts. There's a statement. <laughs> anyway, um, so you know you do you know your brain, you've got two sides of your brain, two hemispheres, and it's connected by this thing called the corpus callosum. So hopefully the two sides are talking to each other, but one side is tends to be more rational, you know, mathematical facts, and the other side is more feelings. Well, it turns out that facts <clears throat> plus feelings is a buying decision, and it's never just one or the other. Mm -hmm. So here's a story. Why did Apple spend over a million dollars on a Cray supercomputer that came with its own 250 kilowatt water-cooled cooling plant and a full-time technician? <clears throat> they had a choice of 256 colors. They insisted on a custom one because that's how Apple rolls. Well, my, um, my cousin Alan, who I stayed with when I used to travel down to Palo Alto, was the principal scientist at Apple, and he took me down to see his new toy, and he designed chips for them. And um, so I said, so Alan, be honest with me, because um, how much of the decision to get this uh, new toy, this supercomputer, was rational, and how much was more emotional, because it was really cool, and you'd be one of the first in Silicon Valley to have this. And he said, oh, it was about 50-50. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty honest. So, you know, there's always an emotional component and you, you get, just got to be aware of that. So they bought a second one. So there are as and many... I'm going to take a, a moment here to remind folks, this presentation that you've assembled is called What Engineers Need to Know About Sales and Marketing. Mm -hmm. So, well, if you go to the next slide, much of some of this people who are on this side of the marketing and sales world, like me, were like, okay, yeah. Like, what's Mark teaching me? I know this. But your point is, what I take for granted is like, yeah, an engineer who has got a decidedly different set of skills may not appreciate some of these distinctions. And therefore, when he or she is out there as de facto salesperson, they may not be aware of some of those tools. So for that audience, I can imagine you presenting this to a bunch of engineers. It'd be interesting for me to hear um, the kind of response you get from them. They're like, wow, Mark, I didn't know this, or that was really helpful, or yeah, I knew that, but I never really thought about it before. What, what kind of reaction do you get? I get, I get a lot of arguments. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> lots of you. Lots, lots of resistance. <clears throat> the but so they say we, I'm interested. So what's the resistance? What do they say? They'll say, oh, you should have focused more on this and more on that. And you should have talked more about marketing. And you should have talked more about this. And this is, I mean, it's just usually to me, it was pretty petty stuff. You so know, they're the, critiquing the, the things that you chose to include or exclude from your presentation? Yeah. But they weren't dissenting with the content itself. No, no. Were they ever saying, I don't agree with what you said? Or were they saying, no, oh, I never I, thought of it that way? Or they just were being persnickety? Yeah, pain in the butt. <laughs> okay, well. Anyway, um, to carry on. So there's so many, probably hundreds of different models of personality types and everything from astrology to psychology to, to all the different flavors. But a common one, and a, and a useful, sim simple one, is what's called five personality types. And you can Google that, and you'll find a whole lot written about this. But they basically break it kind of down into this. And everyone, again, is on a continuum. You know, on the one hand, you can be agreeable. On the other side, you can be argumentative. If you're too agreeable, you're just a pushover. Mm -hmm. And if you're too argumentative, no one wants to deal with you. But, but they both have, you know... They're good things about both of them, and then the others overly sensitive versus detached and impervious, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just it's useful to know where you are and where the people you're dealing with are, are because it gives you some insight. And um, and I detail this. I got stories about this in the book that uh, go into more detail about this. Here's a big one, Joe. Uh, I think you agree. Stories sell. I you know, emphatically agree and believe that stories are required. Yeah. 
Exactly. And um, once something feels right, we use reason and data justify the decisions our emotions have already made. So stories evoke all of our senses. So as an example, like I used that example before, um, and another example is if, if you try to pitch a service to a customer, because a lot of us are consultants, and you say, you know, this is what we, we can, these, here are all the features and benefits of what we do. That's much less powerful <clears throat> than to say, we had a customer just like you, and this is what we did for them, and this is the results and how they benefited. And that's a story, and people can kind of relate. So to be fair, <laughs> what engineers wish salespeople knew? I wish I, I, in the book, I had to use another image because I couldn't find this one to license it, but I thought it was a great picture. <laughs> and a um, couple things. We've all probably gone through having really, you know, developed great products that nobody wants. Like, you need to ask this question, like, who wants it? Is there a market? And that should be the first question you ask. Um, the other thing that engineers, it, it really bothers them is when people, salespeople, you know, promise features that don't exist and time scales that don't exist. Like you'll have it when, and he said it would do what mm -hmm. um, and stuff like that. So that makes life difficult for sales, for engineers. The other thing that engineers oftentimes uh, having to do is um, to kind of, they, they're forced to kind of come up with uh, requirements documents because the marketing folks didn't give it to them. So kind of by default, they had to do that and they don't always get it right, but it's not their fault. It's really marketing's job to tell them what the product definition is and what the requirements are and what the user needs are and, and not leave it, up, leave it up to the engineers, you know, to leave them in the dark. Uh, and, and that's one of their, their uh, pet peeves. So there's a lot of learning that goes on both sides. And um, the important thing is to understand uh, their disciplines a little bit. So we're, um, I love rules of thumb because as a rule of thumb, most rules of thumb work pretty well. Uh, the one with the plan wins. Um, if you've ever gone into a meeting and there are complaints or problems and nobody has any solution, but one person does have a plan, even if it's not a great plan, <clears throat> they're likely to win. So have a plan. Always have a plan B because if things can go wrong, they will go wrong. Like I said, the, the last time I did this presentation, my internet went out and I didn't have a plan B. I should have. And uh, in retrospect, I could have used my cell phone as a hotspot, but I didn't. Uh, optimistic people outperform negative people. There's a good reason to be positive. Here's a biggie. When the customer says yes, stop talking. It's called uh, talking after the close. Um, a lot of times you can talk yourself right out of a sale. Um, and it's better to be lucky than to be smart. Timing, timing, timing is really important. And everybody worries about first mover advantage or second mover advantage. It's, it's just all timing. You know, you could have a great idea, but the economy isn't good. So you can't raise money and people aren't buying stuff or with the Technar pro scan, um, the product that allowed me to retire for 10 years, we developed this product and they said it couldn't be done. It was really technically a challenge and we did it. So then we did it and then we said, but who wants it? <laughs> you know, like we hope somebody wants it. That um, same month, that, that same, go ahead. Ahead. That's same, the same month, the chief of urology from Stanford University published an article that said uh, prostate ultrasound was really important. Couldn't have planned that, couldn't have forecast that or understood that. And we uh, basically, uh, my forecast was that we were gonna sell a million dollars worth of this product the first year we sold a million dollars the first month. Wow. We were very lucky. We were competing against really big companies that had lots of money and lots of technology, but they couldn't move very fast. I mean, we just got it. We killed them. We were number one within a few years, wow. sold the company and uh, lived happily ever after. So that was- Yes, cool. previous slide with the sneaker generated more comments from everyone than anything else you've done. So then they're really interesting in my view. Um, I know uh, having previewed your presentation, do you want to kind of skip through the, the next couple and then I'll, I'll bring them on for that yeah. discussion because I think you're kind of close. So, to this is, so you can read about that. Without Integrity, Nothing Works, Launch Chicken and Games Managers Play. It's good to be aware of those. Final thoughts? Customer I don't know what that last one was. 
Launch Chicken. Yeah, what does that mean? Launch Chicken came out of NASA. It's like if you've got a bunch of engineering groups working on a project uh, and there's a launch date and a deadline, and one of the engineering groups really realizes they're going to miss the deadline, but they don't raise their hand and say, we're going to be late because it makes them look bad. So they hope one of the other engineers raises their hand first. Huh. And the closer you get to launch date, the worse it is. You, know, you look really bad. So know who's going to swerve first. And there are a lot of other games like um, paralysis by analysis, um, uh, premature product release, all kinds of stuff. So I go into that in the book. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you got two ears, one mouth. Listen more than you talk. Yeah. So here's some great books. Lean Startup. Everybody should read that. Uh, Steve Blank gives a lot of talks, and he says, get outside your office. Get outside the four walls of your office. See what the customers are using. This is a sweet little book I wrote. Uh, oh, you wrote it. Yeah. Thanks. These are all available on Amazon. Okay. And the winning title of my book was... Oh, yes. Drum roll. I'm drumming. Hacking Sales and Marketing for Engineers, a sneak peek into what goes on outside the walls of your lab. Available for $5.49 on Amazon as a download. It's a Kindle edition only. And it basically expands upon the things I've talked about with a lot more funny pictures. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Everyone at Joe's Medical Device Group gets a free copy. Hey! And I'm going to ask for 100% of what I want. I'm going to request respectfully that after you read this, you write a review and post it on Amazon and Goodreads while you're at it because reviews are what helps books sell. So okay. Joe, somehow you're going to, there's a Dropbox link that they can download the PDF, a reviewer copy, okay. and you're going to somehow get it to the medical devices group. I sure will. Okay. I don't think I yet have it. You may be. So I'll re, I'll resend it to you. Did you? Okay. I, I thought I, I did. I'd very much like to, uh, do that while folks are on the call and I'll go shopping for that in my inbox as I bring our fine panel of question askers and commenters to the fore. Okay. And I'm going to just uh, send you the link. And I didn't want to give it to everyone because um, if, when you make a recording of this, yeah. post it, I don't want everybody to. Yeah, everyone on earth to get it for free. Let's uh, see. Just I close mean, my door. John Richard, you are first. Tell us what you wrote. Um, I, I'm going to actually have to, I'm going to actually have to look at it. That screen is gone. But basically what it was, was. Uh, I can go back. But no, 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 no. What he wrote. I'll read what you wrote. Oh, go. Please it's great do. to have the tools to venture into the weird world of sales where the air is unbreathable and there is no floor on which to stand. Wait a minute. Say, say again. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I missed that. John Richard, now that I have refreshed you, what did you mean? Say it in a way, Mark. Mark um, basically, basically, what I was saying, what, it, what I envisioned was a, a science fiction movie, which if you want to know how I think, think science fiction, there we go. Um, going into some alternate dimension where there's where you can't breathe the air because it's different air it's some weird air and and you're slipping and sliding and sinking through the floor because they're really because your whole concept of a floor is not there anymore and and going from and going from just solving mechanical or electrical problems to to dealing with human beings in a way that's productive enough to make a sale um, you know, that's why everything like this I tune into and I've got pages of notes and I've got screenshots and everything else and I'm going to read your book and I'm going to make a review of it and everything like this and Thank you. everything I get, everything I get, that's why I got Joe to redo my site and, you know, those are, it, it's that weird world of, hey, I wasn't trained for this, but now that I'm in business for myself, uh, it's time to use it to make some money. So thanks for the view. It's kind of like being in a diving bell and going down and seeing all these weird creatures, you know, that you couldn't see if you just stayed on the surface. Yeah. So that's, that's the comedy. That parallel, yes, you an engineer. 
discovered, perhaps at a time when things weren't coming in as fruitfully as you would have liked that, yeah, we have to tell the story of what you do too, especially for consultants like, like you and like me. Luke, you are on mute and you had a, you are not on mute. I say you're on mute. Is it saying that I need to, um, yes, okay, there. I'm on mute. Yeah. You wrote, yes. I am 100% engineer. Yes. Don't go we get, on. We get requirements, what to design. Should we be more aware of the emotional reactions to the product we design? And if so, how, Mr. Fine? Well, yeah. Um, you know, that's why, you know, the iPod sold a lot and the Microsoft version of their player didn't sell much. And that's what industrial designers are really good at now. You know, so you're not expected to know everything, you know, uh, you know, there are people who make what's inside, you know, it's like the difference between a carpenter and a cabinet maker, right? You know, the carpenter doesn't make what uh, doesn't show fit. No, no, the, the, the cabinet maker what make, makes what shows fit and the carpenter doesn't make anything fit or something like that. Not all joke. You lost us there. Anyway, yes, it's, it's important to know to have a nice package, especially if it's a consumer product, even, even medical products. I mean, the patient's asleep in surgery, but the Da Vinci is a gorgeous design. Uh, his specific question is, how does an engineer become more attuned to the way the product would be received? Get outside the four yes. walls of your office and, and talk to, to the users. Is that always a privilege that engineers are given? No, but you know, I, I think it's great to uh, ask for 100% of what you want. Ask a salesperson if you can go on a sales call with them. I would second that. Mauro, you wanted to contribute? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, for, Mark. Thank you very much for the presentation. I, I can relate to that a lot, a lot because I'm also an engineer as Luke and, and, uh, and you as well. But it, it, it is, I could relate to that one because it took me a while to understand how to transfer that from the engineering world to go back and talk to doctors basically, right? And we all very, I mean, I'm, we are all very nice people. We go out, we talk, and we have that ability. But it, it, it was finally one of those days that I was with the doctor that I understand that they were also, um, as soon as you know, they know you're an engineer, right? They get too guarded because all of a sudden they said, okay, this guy know what he's talking about. I am not the expert on this realm. And, 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 and it's very interesting to see that unguarded people, super smart with the patients, but in this particular subject, they are not. And that's what you, the, all the, what you were talking about, the, the emotional aspect and all the neuros behind it comes in. And it have worked for me. I mean, before going into trying to sell the product, the value proposition, of course I sell myself, but I sell them the idea that we are more like a partners. You know, the physiology, I'm the engineer. Let's talk about it. And here are my colleagues. And I was also, um, hopefully, well, I have worked for companies that like to bring engineers to, uh, to, the, to the hospitals first and foremost, and you see the value of it. But, it, but at the end of the day, it's just uh, knowing the people and what they need, basically. Um, yep. I, I, I was going to, Jose just wrote something that was really interesting I was going to read, but then he, asked some, he added something, so I'm going to bring him on. Um, but I, I will read the first part. He wrote, I love that multiple people have assumed Mark is an engineer. It's because he comes off as one somehow. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think this is sort of just building on what Mauro uh, just said. I think engineers oftentimes are kind of perceived to be more noble and more like just less bullshitty. You know, just like the problem going to give it to you straight. And, and you come across that way, Mark. I, I really enjoyed your presentation. But it, I think it speaks to the value of being able to bring an engineer into a sales process. Um, and, you know, I think we're, we're talking a lot about some of the things that engineers can learn from salespeople. Um, but I think salespeople, to be better salespeople, can learn some things from engineers. 
you know, in, in part in like, you know, just as an example, one thing that I've observed is if you're able to talk about not just the good things, but some of the challenges that you're going to face, you know, and, and some of the potential bad things and how you might get around them and that sort of thing is part of the sales process. It does build rapport with your, you know, your target client. And, and I think that's something that good engineers are kind of used to doing, right? So, so there's some give and take there where engineers can learn to be better salespeople, but salespeople can learn to be better salespeople too, in part through their interactions with engineers. Remind us again, what do you have a degree in and from where? Me? I have a PhD. Oh, him. No, him. No, no, Jose. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm an engineer by training, so I, I do have a PhD in electrical engineering from MIT, but I've got my own company, so I've, and I'm, I lead the sales now, right? And, and I agree with you 100%. I've been saying that for a long time. Or, you know, I observed it a long time ago, is that everyone's in sales, and, and it's, you know, it's learning to communicate. It's all the things that you said. I mean, you laid it out better than I could, but um, you have to, whether you know it or not, everyone's in sales. I'm, I'm reading, uh, I'm not the best at it, but I'm reading Luke's face as, as you speak, Jose, and I'm curious what you would say to the question that he asked earlier, like, hey, I'm an engineer, I was just given specs, I'm building something, how am I supposed to know how it's going to be received? Am I supposed to second guess the marketing people? What, how did you hear that? What do you want me to, you know, it's like, how would you respond, Jose? To me? Oh, um, well, I, 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 I agree. Again, I agree with what Mark said, just the value that it has for engineers to, to get out there and understand the problem from a, from a people point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, engineers are people too, right? Like we, and we understand that there are problems out there. I think sometimes engineers just think so much with, with their left side of the brain that they do lose some, some of that um, ability to recognize how non-engineers view problems and you know it's how you get to like those user interfaces where you have to click seven times one button and then another one and it's like to an engineer it's so logical but it's like yeah most people don't think like that and the more you can have an engineer interact with end users the better product they're gonna they're gonna develop and and that's why it's so important to i used to at my last company we used to have um we used to have almost every day a user come in and every day a potential user for a product and, you know, our product manager or business analyst would, um, you know, perform these kind of usability studies almost on a daily basis. And we would make it a point on almost every one of those sessions, have an engineer, like we would rotate engineers and that to have engineers look at how people were using the product and it would blow their mind. Cause why are they pushing that button? Why are they confused by that? Why are they doing this? You know, it's so valuable to have engineers understand how, how people use products and what they're you know, objections are, what their concerns are, what confuses them. Um, so there's a lot of give and take there. Yeah, I, a, quick, a quick story about that is uh, when I was at Diasonics, um, we had developed a probe to, to be used in the intensive care nursery to scan the baby's brain through the fontanelle. And this probe was quite large and the engineers couldn't understand like, well, I can't really make it smaller. You know, I mean, what, why can't you use this? So I took them into the intensive care nursery and showed them that the premature babies were in these isolettes and they were very tiny and there was just like a small opening. You just had no room. And once they could kind of see like, oh yeah, I've got to be able to get the probe in there and do this, this it, it like clicked and they said, okay, yeah, we understand. Now we can go back and come up with the solution. Nice. Yeah. Joanne, you're next. Oh, thank you. Can you read my question? Something you wrote, um, Mark, I've been in manufacturing for 25 years and I have few skills on how to quote a job. How do I go about learning how to figure out how many hours a job will take and cost? What should I require the client to give me as it relates to job scope? <laughs> That's a whole different presentation. Um, so, you know, that's, that's hard to do. You know, the more information you have from the client, you know, the, the better your estimate can be because you're, you're dealing with facts like, you know, what are the pieces and how many and what it takes. And after 25 years, I would hope you've done enough jobs where you could kind of ballpark stuff, at least give them a range. Um, I, I don't really have more than that to, I'm not a manufacturing engineer. It's a hard job. Yeah, I think that the, the question comes after having had a conversation with somebody who needed to have a certain job done and just wanted to say over the phone, oh, here's what I need and, and expect me to say, oh yeah, that's 10 hours and 
this price, you know, and without requesting something in return, you know, that gives you something in writing for a job scope. Maybe that is a presentation or some kind of a talk. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the very least, you, you want a, a, a bill of materials. <laughs> you know, how, can, how can you quote something without a bomb, a bill of materials? That's another CLA. Or a scope. Bill of materials and a, <laughs> the scope of the job. Yeah, I mean, that's unreasonable. And they're asking you to do some work. And it's a lot of work to sometimes quote stuff. And I think it's fair for you to ask them to do a little bit of work and send you a bill of materials. Okay, yeah, and I totally agree with you that everyone's in sales. I think that's a, a great way to put it because <laughs> over the 25 years, you know, it's even within departments and all that. And it's been interesting now to be looking on the other side, you know, from a sales and marketing perspective. So, thank you. Lucia has been coming and going. Her cat got me in the mood to disturb my dog's sleep. Um, we've seen her this way and this way. She's um, one of yeah, our Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm having, the, the cats are, are swarming right now because I haven't fed them yet. So uh, I've, I've escaped to, to a different room. Um, for God's sakes, feed the animals. <laughs> but before you do, um, this is your first time joining us. Introduce yourself. What do you do? And just... Yeah, um, I am a veterinarian by training and uh, went into the medical device industry. The um, Move away from the window a little bit. Oh, sorry. Let me, I'll go, I'll go back to the swarming kitties. There, I, there think, you go. I think you guys, <laughs> it's, it's a better view of me. Any... That's an and, uh, She said it's a better view of, uh, 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 uh yeah, you, you, you lost connectivity there now. Wi-Fi. We're going to have Lucia figure all of that out and ask Mr. The Tucker. therapeutics industry. Okay. Lucia, you, you broke up terribly and we heard almost nothing. Yes. We, we, um, we heard nothing since you moved. We're where's my conundrum? Nice spot Let me find a place that has both good lighting. I don't know what's up with my internet. All right, stop. Let's see. There I don't know what's are. up with my Stay there. Is this is this working? Don't move. Yeah, now I'm not tell, moving. Yeah, tell us what you were saying. All right, try trying again. <laughs> uh, long story short, after a secure circuitous career path, uh, I am an independent consultant in clinical, medical, and regulatory affairs, and uh, also serve as a startup coach. Nice and across nice. devices and drugs. Oops. Where where are you? Where are you geographically? Where are you based? I am in the Bay Area. More specifically, Redwood City. He wants to come to your house. What's your address, please? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, my and and you're welcome to my house. Is a petting zoo, so I will be. I was happy to see that there's a. I, which obviously I have license to be a petting zoo without being a crazy cat lady or crazy anything else. Um, I am crazy, but not for those reasons. I'm um, talking because be, being the vet gives me license. So I've got the kitties, I've got the bunnies, I've got a chinchilla, I've got chickens going now. In the house, I've got a horse, but he's uh, she's uh, up in, in Portola house. Valley, so not, not does not Redwood City uh, code does not permit me to keep the horse in the backyard. Unfortunately, oh, you had a comment for our presenter as well. Do you want to ask that? Yeah. So one of the things I noticed on your, on your deck, when you were talking about the um, different uh, personality types and uh, the kind of the sliding scale of the five different uh, metrics by which people are judged is that women and minorities are judged very differently uh, across those five uh, values than uh, men are. And uh, just wanted to bring that to the discussion and everybody's awareness that it's one of the challenges of navigate as, as if all, everything that you discussed wasn't hard enough for people to navigate. And I think that people have brought up very good points about, you know, engineers talking to physicians and, um, you know, people from different uh, backgrounds um, communicating effectively to each other 
Um, when you add uh, gender and uh, ethnicity to that, it makes it even even more challenging and complex conversation for some of us. So, um, you know, it's, it's, and, and it's incumbent on both the perceiver um, and the, the person being perceived to be aware of that uh, as they, they handle those negotiations. Have you put any thought into that aspect of the dynamic and how you change or adjust your approach to a potential client uh, accommodating those variables when, when they're relevant? You know, I, I try not to, but, but, but it's there. I mean, you can't deny it that it's there. You know, there's um, all kinds of uh, privileges and extra benefits people have. For instance, tall people sell more than short people. Attractive people, however you judge that, sell more than people who aren't. Um, so, you know, whatever attributes you have, I'd say use them to your advantage. You know, if you're really smart or friendly or tall or what, whatever, um, you know, there's certain things that you can't change. You know, you can change how you dress. You know, you can change your vocabulary. You can change your communication skills, but you can't change, you know, what color you are. You were born that way, you know. Um, so just, you know, whatever your whatever cards you were dealt, I'd say just use them to the, the, the advantage, to the greatest advantage. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Jonathan, you've been very patient. Yeah. Uh, hi, Peter. Uh, actually, Jonathan was ahead of you. Okay. Uh, although I am eager to hear what you have to say. I, um, yeah, so, I, I'd like to make a quick point, if, if I can, when I can, and then I have to log off the call for another call. Jonathan, do you mind? The good man. Please. Thanks, okay. buddy. Hey, uh, Mark, I, I just wanted to respond to... Uh, the point that uh, Joanne, the question that Joanne Evans, Evans asked, uh, which uh, I, I found in my experience is a situation that comes up quite often where somehow a customer uh, gets through into engineering or manufacturing and uh, puts pressure on somebody to, to uh, produce a quotation for a job. And um, I, I'm, Joanne, of course, I know nothing about your, your company, but um, surely the company should be buffering you from those kind of calls, because for you to be uh, unfairly pressured into taking a call like that and responding to a value customer uh, puts you and the uh, and the customer and potentially the product and the company in, in not the best light for the company, uh, uh, for, to, to the customer. Um, and so depending on your situation there, uh, I would suggest get with management and uh, find a way to, as I say, to buffer you from those calls. Um, Hi, Peter. Can I, can I interject? Yeah, go ahead, Joanne. Yeah, it, sorry for jumping in. Um, <clears throat> the last full-time job that I had working for a company was about two years ago. I started my own company called EM Colorado, and... It, it, I have worked contract positions mostly where I'm hired under a 1099. So uh, I had a recent conversation actually starting, I wanted to just help somebody to get the, to get what they needed, but it was interesting within the conversation. And then um, Mark, you brought it up. Yeah. After 25 years, I should know how long it takes to do a job, but that's the point. <laughs> the point is, is that, my expertise is in quality systems, and I have worked in manufacturing for medical device, pharmaceutical, <laughs> API. I mean, I've run the gamut of different jobs in quality assurance and regulatory and all that. So I'm, my expertise is in doing procedures, and I just finished validation training system, design control training system. And so I understand these things, and I also understand that you can't really nail it down. So if I, have a, if I were to hire a contractor, and I've seen this happen in taking a company out of a warning letter, yeah, I can hire them. And if I sit them down on a procedure, I can say, yeah, it's probably going to take about two weeks to bring this around. But you can't control all the people who have to look at it, their, um, their feedback, their input. I mean, I had a delay 
of work for two months on one procedure that was promised to the FDA. So when I look at, at this and I think about quoting a job, when somebody says, oh, okay, I need you to do the validation work to do this work, and they're not willing to put something in writing, you know, and then even at that, you can't control when they're going to get back to you, when they're going to look at it. How do you quote that kind yeah, of thing? Jo Jan, I, I have to jump off the call right now. And before I do, Mark, thanks very much for your presentation. I'm for sure going to be reading one or two of your books. I liked everything you said. But Thank Joanne, you. everything you've just said now reinforces my thought that you need to be, your position there needs to be buffered by the company so that uh, none of you goes through that experience. But seriously, I need to jump off the call to take another one. Thanks, Thanks guys. Peter. So Joanne, I, a couple of quick things to say. Um, first of all, you know, one thing you can say is generally, you know, from what your description is, our experience is it going to take between this and that, you know, you can kind of give a range, you know, based on our experience and say, but you know, every job is different and things may come up that are unanticipated. And if the scope changes or things happen, and, you know, that's an honest answer and say, you know, the more information I have from you, the, the better answer I can give you. But based on what you've told me, you know, that's the best I can do. The, the other side of that coin is uh, when I was at AutoNexus, the last company I was at, um, we were looking to hire a contract uh, engineering firm to do some work. And they said, <laughs> they said, so how much you got? You know, what's your budget? And we said, oh, we've got about a million dollars guess what every proposal came up with they were all within you know this much you know a few hundred dollars of a million dollars uh how much did it really cost us two million dollars but that doesn't matter you know because you know mm. there's feature creep and things change and you don't anticipate stuff so you know you just uh it's it's all about communication and you don't want to put people down and, and and be combative about it but it's just be curious it's like yeah, I'd, I'd really like to help you out. Can you tell me a little more so I can, you know, the more information I have, the more uh, helpful I can be and the more accurate I can be. And, you know, you just have a nice chit chat. Thank you. I appreciate the feedback on that. Hey, Joe, you know, for Lucia brought up, you know, um, bias. And in this industry for women, there is a subconscious bias. And it's something that I think that we all need to be aware of. It took me a really long time to understand what was going on from a subconscious bias level. And Mark, you make a really good point, you know, tall people, short people, <laughs> you know, they're, they're viewed differently. But I think that if women are going to be successful in engineering, that we really need to bring that to the forefront so that it's understood because it has stood in my way of moving up in so many ways. It's, it, I don't think that men will understand what we're actually going through. Um, my daughter just learned, and I just learned, that in the universities, they're having to now coach women who are going into engineering for what they're going to be coming up against. And I, I, I would really ask that the men in this group really, really stop and take a look and ask women, what are you going through? It's, a, it's an important question that we need. For sure. Thank you. For sure. And, and, as, and just to add to that, when I, I, I really liked the, um, the scale of the five different, uh, I can't remember if they were referred to as remotion, emotions or perceptions um, on the um, PowerPoint deck. Uh, but if you feel like somebody is over... Um, uh, I wish I had the slide in front of me, um, but, you know, persistence versus, you know, apathy or, you know, anytime you get sort of a, you know, being pushy versus not pushy um, or too passive, anytime that you have a perception about somebody, especially if they're female, especially if they're a minority, to catch yourself and just challenge that just a little bit. Um, because I think those are things that are programmed into us from a very early age when we were in preschool and earlier. Um, it's not anybody's fault or their intent that they perceive and think that way. It's been ingrained um, and it was taught. And so to kind of unteach yourself, you, you have to sort of question yourself and just be aware as the perceiver 
you know, the, as the person perceives, there's only so much you can do to, you know, put your best foot forward. Um, I think it's incumbent on the perceivers as well to um, catch their, their judgment and also um, for us to all acknowledge that uh, women behave differently than men. And so rather than women trying to act more like men in uh, the corporate environment, which is often what a lot of the training is, um, is trying to get women to lower their voices and, and, you know, be more like this or be more like that, which comes down to be more like a man, uh, for women, men to also understand what women's styles are and how they differ and uh, adapt to them. So that's, <laughs> I'll get off my soapbox. It, it Thank you, Lisa. And, and Joanne, I'm, I'm going to just, um, with respect, move on to Jonathan because we're coming up to 90 minutes and I like to at least get folks back to their day. Um, so let's continue that conversation on, in the in the premium channel, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan Saul, God bless you. Patient man. Very patient. Mark, thank you for your presentation. Um, and thanks for taking my question. My, my question really relates to um, exercises that you would recommend by putting engineering, marketing, and sales into a space and having him work on a particular task or objective. And of your favorite exercises, which ones do you find the most um, conflictual, mo the most chaotic, that, that create the most amount of anxiety or animosity or stress, um, but actually create a lot of value um, as an observer uh, watching them engage? Yikes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of taking this on the road, you know, meeting with HR departments and saying uh, me and my partner, Danny Kreindler, who I think you might know, Joe, um, you know, yeah, he's, a, he's, been, yes, remember, he's a member of MTG premium and, and just basically doing, you know, some all day trainings. Cause I used to do that with the nonprofit um, and work with groups and we would, you know, you know, we'd fire hose them with a lot of information, but we'd also have some exercises. So role playing is fun. But it's just, um, I just, you know, we're social beings and just sitting down and talking to people, it just opens up stuff. And um, so I, I don't have any specific exercises. I mean, I've been through all kinds of stuff. And, you know, the worst one is uh, <laughs> there's a story about the sales managers interviewing sales, potential sales candidates. And he says, uh, here, sell me this pencil. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, that's the useless. Um, so I don't have anything specific to tell you, but it, it might be fun to see how, what we develop. Thank you. Great. Uh, Jeff, you were next. Uh, sure. So I, I had a, a comment and Mark, I wanted to get your comment on it. Um, so originally in the early part of your presentation, you were talking about how engineers kind of stereotypically view salespeople and kind of that, that used car salesman sleazy kind of vibe. Um, I feel like a lot of that comes from um, engineers' perception that the the product that is being sold is not actually valuable to the customer, that that they're not actually going to get the value out of it. And to me, that's that's really key to solving that sales conundrum is whoever is selling it. Like for me, so I'm a, I'm a solo consultant, so I'm both the implementer, the provider, and the salesperson. Um, I have total control over both sides. So I know that what I'm selling is valuable to a certain person. And my goal is to find the particular people who get the value out of what I do. Um, and then just be honest with them and they'll either see the value in it or not. Yeah. Uh, so, so like for a larger company where, uh, is it really man management's job to, ma to provide that? Like how can kind of the engineers and the salespeople solve that paradox in a larger group where yeah you know one person doesn't have control over it does that make sense of, of course so in the book i have what i call the obligatory diagram you know block diagram of, of how sales and marketing and engineering and product management and all those stuff work together in defining a product you know and it it starts with a customer need like a really cool project i'm working on now uh, with UC San Francisco uh, Medical Center, my alma mater, 
um, a trauma surgeon approached us years ago and said, here's what keeps me up at night. I mean, that's a, that's a good problem to solve. It's, it's, a, it's a huge amount of pain. Mm -hmm. And um, so the first thing you do is listen to them and say, well, what are you doing now and what works and what doesn't work and what do you, what do you want? And over the la last couple of years, we've um, been thinking this through and doing experiments. And we just submitted a $1.5 million proposal to Department of Defense and knock on wood, we'll find out in a couple of months whether we got funded to, to do the next step. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess maybe the maybe my question is more when you when you're in one of these roles and you feel like that that fit is not there or that maybe the product is good but it's being targeted at the wrong market and you're responsible for selling it. I don't know what what are some strategies people can use to try to improve that situation. Well, you know, you just bring it up and it, and it helps if you've got data, <laughs> you know, you, can, you okay. can say, this is how I feel and this is my opinion. <clears throat> but to say, you know, I went out and talked to five users and this is what they all said, you know, um, it's hard to argue with that. And some companies are very inflexible and, you know, there's an old saying, it's hard to tell somebody something if they already know everything, you know? And uh, so some people are flexible and they can change and some people aren't. And, um, you know, the customer's always right, you know? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was good. Rick Stockton, our last presenter today, speaker today. What have we got? Uh, mute. You're on mute. There it is. Thank you. Okay. I'll, um, I'm actually, to be concise, I'm just going to read my question. Um, and that is, sometimes you were talking before, about people who call in, they perhaps they want a fixed price, but they don't have enough information to generate a fixed price. My practice has been to offer them three alternatives. Um, the first would have been the fixed price quote, but they really don't know enough about what they want, time, delivery, etc. The second one would be to say, well, in lieu of that, you can skip that. Um, but we'll settle on an hourly cost and we'll, and we'll work out a reporting type situation. And I have a lot of customers who really like that because they love the freedom to constantly change direction and pursue the best possible course. Third uh, is, is, is I'll say I'll quote you a fixed price for doing a uh, basically a project plan so that you know what your scope is enough so that if after that you would like to have, if you would like to go ahead with a fixed price, you can. If you'd like to go ahead with the flexibility of hourly, you can. Um, I've, I've only had one customer take me up on that. Uh, usually, the, usually they let the amount of information they have and what I can do for them, that kind of makes the decision. Is there a way I could, uh, there's room for improvement in anything, but there may be great room for improvement in this presentation. Uh, what would you suggest? I, I really like option number three. I call that discovery. So the way we work at Andrews Cooper, the company I work for, you know, we have a conversation and we don't charge. You know, it's we'll talk to you and we'll bring in particular people and we'll kind of spoke to them and kind of see if there's a good match. Don't charge for that. And then Mark, I don't know why, but for the first time, you're it's harder to hear you. Oh, sorry. You're having a rough time too. Hmm. And, and in the meanwhile, during this awkward pause, I just downloaded Mark's book as a PDF. I put it in premium under our weekly call. And I also gave you the links where you can, and we ask that you do, review the book on Amazon and on Goodreads. No. Yeah. yeah, it was... Uh, it was Rick's side that was making it noisy. I just muted him. Okay. Can you hear me okay now? Now I can, yes. So I like option three. So uh, I call that discovery. And you can say, look, we're, we're going to spend a couple weeks or a month and, you know, and there's a fixed price and we'll just basically help you build out, you know, your requirements and things like that. And then based on that, we can give you a, a better, better idea of what the whole project will cost. And, um, and we charge like let's say $25,000 for that. And what's good is that's a great way of qualifying customers. If customers don't wanna pay for that, probably not the customer we're gonna want. Um, so uh, 
again, the initial consultation, you know, we'll bring in engineers and we're happy to talk to you and look at it, but to do a formal discovery, a lot of companies, you know, they want you to do product development, but they don't really have it scoped out and they haven't really done the full, you know, some more TLAs, PRDs, MRDs, DR, you know, all the documentation for requirements, user requirements, engineering requirements, marketing requirements, product, re all that stuff. So charging them to do that, you're putting, you're helping them out because that's really valuable. First of all, you need that before you can proceed. You also need all of that stuff in med medical stuff for all the quality systems and stuff. So it's, it's a good thing to do. And if, if they're willing to do that, you pretty much nailed the rest of the, the million dollar, the million dollars at the end of that. Thank you. Right. Yeah, I learned the hard way not to do that for them and not charge them for it. Yeah, there's an old saying in psychiatry, if they don't, if the patient doesn't pay for it, they don't get better. Mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm <laughs> oh, that's end, good. I'm going to end this with a psychiatry joke. How many light bulbs does it take to change a person? Does it, how many light bulbs does it take for a site? How many light bulbs does it take? To change? How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? Change a light bulb? Okay. Um, I don't know, but I figured out the question. Okay, just one, but the light bulb has to really want to change. All right. Oh, God. Anyway. To give you an idea, Mark, of what kind of person I am, I didn't turn on my record option until you started telling me the joke. It's <laughs> terrible. Everything else I thought I could write down, but Ladies I didn't want to give a joke wrong. At 9.34 Pacific time, Mark mm. Fine now has the honor of having the longest webinar presentation in our 45 episode history. Yay. So a hasty goodbye. Thank you for sticking around. Um, the many people who are still on today's call. Mark, you got that many comments because you shared something of value. We appreciate it. And uh, having flipped through the book, I see that there's quite a bit of the book in today's presentation. So if you enjoyed that, You'll surely enjoy that read. Please be sure to uh, review it on Amazon and Goodreads, those links in our weekly call on MDG Premium. For MDG Premium, this is Joe Hage signing off. Thanks and have a good weekend. See you next week, guys. Bye.